And then he started doing like a Donald Trump accent and like some other accents. And, and finally he turned around after speaking for like a few minutes. It was bloody Johnny Depp. Hi, this is Charlotte for Enemy. And I'm speaking to Dave Bailey from Glass Animals for our In Conversation video series. Yo. Hi, Dave. Hi, Charlotte. How are you? How are you, how are you today? I'm really good, actually. Yeah, it's been um, it's been a, a good day, I'd say. Finished a music video, made a Pez dispenser with uh, a, one of my bandmates' heads on. It's going well so far. I've been hearing about this merchandising. This is um, so you've yeah. got Pez dispenser. What else is on the Pez dispenser? Online? We have well, this is unreleased as yet, but there's the VHS cassette version of the album on a. Uh, a cassette complete with a holographic sticker um, what else has happened I don't know I've tried to do a lot of crazy crazy shit that didn't quite work I tried to make like this which is like a ray gun but I was going to put sound effects from the album on um, <laughs> but it didn't that didn't work uh, yeah it's got it's gotten totally out of hand we have a candle we have shoes we've got all sorts of crap could you tell us what um, music video you were filming today or is that yeah, well, I was kind of just like doing the like final little bits. It's for a song called It's Also Incredibly Loud. Great song. Um, I basically just had to um, jump in a swimming pool over and over again at about six in the morning. It was quite, it was pretty full on. So it's going to be an, an aquatic themed music video. Yeah, I've got like the snorkel and everything. <laughs> Uh, no, I actually don't. I just jump. I just jump off a diving board. Does this uh, music video have anything to do with the request to fans to take three D scans of their heads? This is a different one. The, oh. the, the three D scan with the heads one. I don't actually know what that's going to turn out like. We've like handed over the scans to this guy. He's called uh, Mar Marco Moroni. And he's like an amazing 3D animator. And what he tends to do is like make people's heads like explode in 3D. Um, so it's kind of just in his hands now. I'm, cu I'm curious to see what happens. Which song would that be for? Are you allowed to tell us? It's for a song called Tangerine. Oh, yes. Second, second on the new album. Good song as well. Which oh, I okay. have, have heard, I've heard this week. How are you, how are you feeling about it then? Because it's... it's um, well, it's been, is it four years since your last one? Four years, yeah, it's been a minute. It's been, a, been quite a long time, but the time has also flown by. Uh, it's, basically, it feels, it feels like you're sending your kid off to the first day of school. That's how, and I, like, we've done, we've done it twice before, and you kind of send the kid off, you know, hope it makes some friends, and you hope it's okay, you hope it's like, you know, not necessarily like a jock, but like, kind of, all right, you know, makes doesn't get bullied mm -hmm. um and this time it feels like we're sending a kid off to school but like because the world's in such a weird place like maybe the school's full of like sharks or something <laughs> so it's a bit nerve-wracking and then there's no touring and which has always been a huge that's like kind of part of the album for me i've always seen that as yeah there's the music and that's like the body and the head and then touring's like a leg or, or something and maybe the other limbs are like the artwork and how you use the internet nowadays they're all like part of an album um yeah. and that all like makes the album and we've lost a we've lost leg so we're trying to find like we're replacing it with really weird crazy naff merch and i was also going to ask with touring kind of you know indefinitely on hold for lots of artists across the world what are you what are you going to do to replace that other than merchandising you know you did that pop-up gig in hackney over the weekend yeah. are you going to do more little impromptu um pop-up sessions for people or no, we got in trouble you're just gonna let yeah. people live with the album and just wait until you can get back out on the road properly again we've got other stuff like the, we did the impromptu gig but like as soon as we started the song we saw the police at the other end of the park it was like london fields and i don't know if you've been to london fields but yeah 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 it's sort of like long and thin and we saw the police just like we hit note one and they just went whoop and looked at us and then started they were very like nice about it they started like walking slowly towards us like laughing at us and then we finished the song and they were like get out of here 
Um, so we probably won't do that again. <laughs> yeah, because you need a, you need a busking permit, I believe. Uh, apparently, yeah. And also, you don't want to do what we did by accident is we did it in front of this like billboard that the label very kindly got us. We wanted them to get their money's worth, so we thought like let's busk in front of it. It'd be funny. Did it, and what we didn't realize is that like right next to the billboard is a huge sign that says no amplified music. Um, a fine will be incurred, and uh, yeah. So we should we we need to get this busking permit before we do any any more of those. But we're going to do other stuff. We've got like loads of stuff happening on the internet. We released this thing called like we call it the Dream Machine, where you can only listen to. There's a new song that's been released, but you can only listen to it if you go onto the site and close your eyes. Oh. And the more people that are like on there simultaneously with their eyes closed, the more of the song gets played. Has this been launched already? Yeah, just launched yeah. the other day. So like you get like another layer every time and they we haven't got to the vocals yet because they haven't. Oh. Quite, we, uh, I think there was like a little bit of time yesterday where they were like, I don't know, however many thousand people on it with their eyes closed simultaneously. It takes like a synchronicity. Um, That's really cool because I'd come across uh, the very 90s looking desktop. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Website, but I hadn't, I hadn't come across that yet. Um, so just just moving on to the new record, Dreamland. Um, this is clearly, you know, your first foray into it being a, a, an autobiographical album. Um, and I was reading how Agnes from your last album, How to Be a Human Be Being, um, was the catalyst for you to write more personally. Uh, I mean, that song in particular is written about, um, well, in the aftermath of a suicide of a close friend of yours. Um, I was curious, is, was that the only catalyst? Or do you feel like sort of with age and more experience going through life that maybe it was inevitable that you were eventually gonna turn the focus onto, onto yourself? It was a couple of things. That was definitely like that, that started the ball rolling. And then uh, Joe obviously had his really bad, our drummer had a really bad accident. And I kind of, yeah, I was stuck in the hospital with him for a, a long time. Um, I say stuck, like I wouldn't have been anywhere else. I, I wanted to be by his side and just find that when the, f yeah, I didn't know if the band was going to continue. I didn't know if he'd survive uh, anything, if he'd make a recovery that allowed him to drum again. I don't know. So uh, the future looked like, yeah, shit. Um, and I was stuck inside all day without I wasn't going out I wasn't some friends or anything so your brain kind of automatically goes to memories I think like to feel like to feel like a human you need to be experiencing stuff you need to be doing new stuff otherwise you don't really feel alive so I think your brain like compensates by having really crazy dreams and yeah just feeling that nostalgic feeling like really just comes to the forefront and all these memories that you've forgotten about you start reliving them and seeing them in a different light so that was definitely like all at the forefront of my mind after his accident and then he had this like really pivotal surgery and started talking so I was saying a few words and he was like Dave I just need some time like I'm gonna be here for a couple of months recovering you go to LA do your do some stuff so I had all this time and started writing for other people, doing some production stuff. And because that stuff was at the forefront of my mind, I started writing about it. Started writing like personal stuff, but someone else was singing. So it's actually like kind of fine. Yeah. Um, it didn't feel very exposing. And then when it came time to write the record, I just kind of kept doing it. Yeah. It was really encouraging working with a lot of people. Like I work with a lot of artists who are very vulnerable in their writing. And when I was writing stuff that was like personal, with them or for them uh, and they gravitated towards that more than the really abstract stuff I'd done on the previous records. That was definitely like another like, yeah, do it. Yeah. And, and how does it make you feel putting this record out into the world that, you know, is essentially a, a long diary entry on your formative years into adulthood? Pretty weird. I've always, like, I've always been told by my mum, never, like, don't talk about yourself. Think about other people first. They're way more important. And I've always thought that way. And I always thought, like, maybe, you know, that's, what, that's why I want to write about other people. But then I kind of had this revelation after doing all this other production and writing stuff that actually all of my favourite songs by, other, by my favourite artists are the really, really personal ones. And it's because they make you feel basically less 
alone. That's I, they justify the way that you're, if you're feeling weird, they kind of justify that because mm-hmm. you can see a bit yourself in them and their vulnerability is like, Oh, it's actually like, it's okay. You, you feel better about yourself. So I was, yeah, I don't know. I just thought maybe I can like actually, if Agnes did that for someone, I saw the parallel between Agnes and some of those, my favorite songs by other people. And was like, oh, maybe I should just keep trying this. But I do feel very like self-conscious still. Mm. I just keep telling myself that, that is actually like not too selfish, but also I'm like, God, this is really fucking selfish. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like so torn. I'm so torn. Um, that's how I feel. And I feel a bit naked. I feel like I've, I've just like, I don't know, taken all my clothes off and on August 7th, I'm going to like run out into the street and be like, what's up? Hey everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, you were mentioning about uh, Joe there and his accident and for viewers that aren't aware, Joe was involved in a, a really horrific accident. He was knocked off his bike in Dublin in 2018. So, I mean, it's been coming up to two years since then now. Um, how does that incident play out on you as a band now? Like, how does it affect you now? Um, I guess now that the record's finished, it's, yeah, it's about the next steps. We just feel very, very, very lucky <laughs> to be, to be where we are, to be able to make another record, mm-hmm. um, and to be able to, you know, tour in the future. Uh, uh, we did this like mini tour of all the first venues we ever played in our career to kind of one to like give Joe a nice place to start, start mm-hmm. small and like get comfortable on those smaller stages again. And two, just because when Joe had that accident, we were like, Oh, we are so f- fucking lucky to be able to just like make music together all the time. It's a, it's a dream. And sometimes you kind of forget that how you forget how lucky you are when you're yeah. like waking up in a different city every day and you're like just totally, you don't really know where you are. And you're just like waking up at six doing promo, 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 sound check, live show, back to sleep, wake up. You kind of forget. And uh, it was a real reality check. And it was euphoric when we, when we finally, especially like the London and Manchester shows that we did. Just, wow, that was special. And how is he doing nowadays? Because uh, Enemy was at the one of the Manchester shows, and mm-hmm. you know, watching him acing it behind the kit, and it was very emotional. Um, you know, have you seen much of him in, in lockdown? You know, besides the various confusing rules from the government, um, yeah, have you spent much time with him? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, the, like, he's he's texting me right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we we talk a lot. This, the magic of uh, Zoom and the internet call and FaceTime has meant that I get to see him pretty much every five minutes. Uh, and since the rules have locked up, we've like, you know, we're allowed whatever like bubble thing mm-hmm. is. He's in my bubble. Of course. <laughs> and, and how's he doing, you know, physically? Is he, is he, is he back to where he was before the accident or is it, is it a, you know, healing, there are a lot of ups and downs. and Yeah, there are a lot of ups and downs. I, I don't know how much you like, ever fully recover from something like that. Mm-hmm. I think the main thing that tends to be an issue is just a confidence thing. Because we take a lot of things for granted. We wake up, we expect to be able to like walk and talk and listen and hear and see and stuff. And he went through a phase where that, what you know, he'd wake up thinking all of that was going to be cool and then he'd try to move and can't and try to speak can't and i think that really does i will never understand what that does to you yeah mentally so i I don't know if you can ever fully like psychologically recover but the guy is like probably the most stubborn person i know and that has definitely worked to his benefit in the sense that he like he's he was on a bike when he had the accident but the first thing he wanted to do was get back on a bicycle and now he's back on a bicycle and like it's amazing flipping about yeah i mean i think he's a bit nuts for doing it to be honest i i still can't get on a bike um yeah i i have one and i just like his there is sitting out rusting i'm scared so going um back to the album um how did you sort of pull together to get it recorded you know I take it you were writing the songs. I mean, you are the, the chief songwriter, but was this all sort of at your place in London? Like where, 
were you writing the music there, recording it in the same place, or were you moving to different studios? What was the paper yeah, picture for me? Almost all of it. And this this is the room. This is the room. I can give you a very quick tour if you like. Oh yes, please. Uh, yeah, it's it's not huge, but you don't need much these days. All these people's giant studios. Mm -hmm. Come on, you're kidding yourselves. But this is it. This is like my setup. Ooh, wow. Um, I like the yeah. neon lights. The neon lights, well, they're just like basically an excuse for me to uh, feel like I'm in Miami. Um, <laughs> no, I am in like the greyest part of the world, probably. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is it. I just I made, literally made it on all this shit. I wrote all the songs on these two guitars. Mm -hmm. Started with those. Everything started on those, that bass guitar and that guitar. And, um, is this the Beatles bass? That is the classic Beatles bass, yeah. So I was going to ask you about this. Is it because it was the model and, and um, well, the model that Paul McCartney used? Or like, why is it a Beatles bass? It is the model Paul McCartney used. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, it's got something to it. It's, not, it's um, probably one of the like worst made pieces of equipment ever on earth. But uh, there's like a magic sound to it. Did you set out to get this bass? Were you like, oh, I've, I, I like it. I've heard it on Beatles records. I want that same tone. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I, I basically, like, when I was sitting down to do this, like starting this album, I had the like umbrella idea, which was it's going to be quite autobiographical. It will go through these memories that have been like swelling around in my head. I'll start with my first ever memory and go up until now and like try to hit all the formative things, good, bad, sad, weird, mad crazy stupid all, everything um and then i thought like how am i going to put the sounds behind this i think the best thing to do is probably think about the things that soundtracks life um and the like absolute backbone of that was beatles beach boys nina simone bill withers um and then dr dre and timberland um and missy elliott you can hear you can hear the influence yeah missy elliott bit of eminem in there and so i literally got all the equipment they use like this there's this keyboard here that is the like mellotron. Um, the mellotron beach boys beatles like strawberry fields classic and then i got all the samplers and stuff that dr dre and timberland used and recorded those through these like beach boys and beatles sounding like preamps and guitar amps yeah it's like basically resampling all the shit that the beatles and beach boys might have done mm -hmm. like emblem and dr Dre might have done and then re-recording all the stuff that like Timberland and dr Dre might have done about recording it through beatles -y stuff and when you'd write these songs would you let's say you wrote a song you know you you started sketching out a song in the morning would you sort of ring up the rest of the group and say, come round and have a listen? Like, I'm just trying to imagine what it's like, the, 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 wrote, the writing process. Um, I normally wake up really late in the middle of the night with like an idea. My bedroom is there. It's above, it's above this room. Um, so I come down here in my pants and I hit record and I go and I just start a song. And then I like a few hours later, I go back to bed and then I wake up in the morning. I don't know. It's like, opening a pack of Pokemon cards in the morning or something you don't know. Maybe you get a Charizard. Maybe it's just like a, another Jigglypuff or something. I don't know. So it's a bit of a, <laughs> that's kind of how it works. And then um, if it's a chat, if it's, I don't know, something good ish or something that I, I think like, Oh, there's something in that. I'll you normally develop it a little more, um, create a demo and then I'll, hide it for about a month <laughs> because I'll get really insecure. There's like these, they're like waves of making music and you kind of go like, Oh, this is really good and exciting. Oh, this like sucks so much. And at that point, that's where I get to, I get to that point where like, I think this is so shit. What was I ever thinking? And then I like hide it. And then um, I'll like go through all the songs like a month later and be like, Oh, actually there's something in that. This is really cool. I'll do a little more and then I'll send it to the guys. Um, and then at that point, sometimes we work remotely. Sometimes they'll come over here. We'll, they'll start like poking holes in it. They'll be like, that bit's shit. That bit's and, shit. and adding their own written parts, like for instance, um, I don't know, like Heatwave off the new album, that central guitar riff, was that one that you wrote or was that something that Drew added in at another time? That was, that was my one. Yeah. That particular one, yeah. Um, it, de it depends a lot on the song. 
I think in most cases, like I'll, I'll definitely have most of the like riffs and the chords and all the vocals will be finished at that point and the general soundscape, mm -hmm. I'll get it to that position. And then sometimes you like, we poke holes in it for like a, a month and we, we listen back to the demo and we're like, oh, it's lost something, it's lost a magic. So Heat Waves is very much, it's quite similar to the like very original demo. Yeah. Um, that I made. I actually made that, that was one of the first songs written for the album. And wow, so weird. basically I was playing that song really loud. I finished writing it, it was like four in the morning or something finished writing it was listening to it really really loud in this room and um it's song stopped and i could hear someone behind me like playing around on a piano and i turned around and i was like whoa who's that and all i just saw i just saw hair and like a cigarette coming out from behind this hair and i was like who's that and they were like it's johnny and i was like who's johnny what what how'd you get in here and he was like uh, and he started telling me the story from behind his hair about a comedian called Doug Stanhope and then he started doing like a Donald Trump accent and like some other accents and and finally he turned around after speaking for like a few minutes it was bloody Johnny Depp had just like was stumbled into the studio and just started like talking at me and it was great he told me how he got the accent for uh Willy Wonka and Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory and I thought it was amazing he said he like he said he imagined George W. Bush getting really, really, really stoned. And, um, he, but he did it. So he started talking like George W. Bush. And as he was talking in George W. Bush's accent, he took a, he went like through his like unlit cigarette and um, then like started like his changing his voice in real time, like growing towards this Willy Wonka accent, George W. Bush getting stoned. And I was like, wow, that is... Have you got the scoop, Dave? That's the question. I don't know if I don't know if this has been reported before. You may have a good story there to. That, I don't know. No, no, no. I'm not like. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, just just because I'm conscious of time, seeing as Zoom had uh, cut short a lot of our yeah, time. Yeah, sorry, I went off on one there. Uh, no, it's fine. Well, actually, you mentioned about uh, Johnny Depp imagining George Bush stoned. Um, drugs, drugs references, be it you know caffeine or cocaine or or weed that's appeared a lot throughout your three albums um is it something you partake in a bit of recreational drug use i couldn't possibly say <laughs> no you know what i'm pretty i'm pretty well behaved for the most part i had a phase when i was like really young when i was like 13 14 15 where I, yeah i did yeah. um yeah too much and we're we talking weed mainly we're talking are you, I, I've never been, well, I, I don't like cocaine. No, I've tried it, never liked it. Um, I've, yeah, and I've tried stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think a lot of young people have. I don't think there's, you know, anything. I think, people... like, I don't know. I'm always curious about the world. I think it's, I find it a little bit weird when someone has never tried anything sometimes, mm -hmm. even if it's just like, I don't know, like a beer. <laughs> um, but that happens that's like I grew up in America in Texas and that's like that's they basically put all the kids in the classroom and they show you like pictures of car crashes and say like this is what happens if you drink alcohol and uh, yeah so, and this is this of course is the country that you know runs rampant with its crazy gun laws and yeah also rolls nicely onto my next question um which is about Space Coast, Ghost Coast to Coast, which is a program in the US, I think. It's a program, yeah. I don't know if you know Adult Swim, Cartoon Network, it's a Cartoon Network program. Yeah. Right. Well, this is then also the title of a song off your album, uh, which you revealed in, in an interview recently was um, written after learning that an old school friend of yours in the US, whom you'd yeah. lost touch with once you'd returned, uh, well, once you'd moved to England, um, had brought a gun to school and had actually attempted a, a school shooting. Um, yeah. So had he, had he actually, when you say attempted a school shooting, was he caught before anything yeah. went wrong? Yeah. Yeah, nothing. It was, it was okay in the end. Yeah. And, and how did it make you feel to, you know, learn this of, a, of an old pal of yours? I get, I, the main thing was trying to understand how someone who, like, 
was such a like innocent person in that that naivety no one is necessarily born with the urge to do that and it certainly wasn't there when we were friends it's just funny seeing how that change is possible um and that's i guess that's what a, a lot of this album is about and how there's certain like ways of behaving imposed on you as a as a kid growing up in certain parts of the world that can really can really mess you up and now that you've lived on both sides of the atlantic do you with the school shootings in the u.s do you kind of do you see the u.s now as a as a more dangerous people a place for people to grow up in than the uk for instance I mean, certainly, in, like when it comes to gun laws, yes, yeah. The, I mean, you only have to look at how many people get shot here and how many people get shot there to not, to realise that um, something's got to change over there. And has it put you off? For instance, I don't know if you've ever dreamt of settling down in the US. You know, in the future, is that something? If you were wanting to have kids, that might make you not move. I have thought about that, yeah. I think it's something you have to consider, and I can't. I can't say it didn't it hasn't like crossed my mind. Even with me moving there, there are a lot of tensions there, and I've seen it at shows that we've done. You know, the Westboro Baptist Church turned up at one of our shows, and their entire thing is baiting people mm-hmm. until they are violent. I think that definitely happens less in this country. And and there's lyrics in that song in particular where you talk about you know if you sort of been this is directed at your old friend you know if you've been playing too much gta um listening to too much dr dre do you really mean what you say in those lyrics do you think playing video games that are violent can kind of incite violence in young people no not really i, I actually think that was kind of that's the more t- like tongue-in-cheek perspective and then later on in that song it kind of addresses the stuff that i think is probably more likely the cause of that kind of change in someone i think they're they're really harsh gender stereotypes applied in the states i think the internet is pretty that can do all sorts of things to your brain the family dynamics i think all this stuff is really confusing when you're young yeah i think i think can lead people to do pretty awful things Mm -hmm. that you know i've seen it affect people's mental health so much in a in a kind of where they want to hurt themselves as well. And I was curious about um, features on this album. You've got a feature from the rapper Denzel Curry. Um, did you did you do any sessions with anyone else, or or was there anyone that you really wanted who basically said no? No. Well, I uh, asked Denzel. He said yes. Thank God. That was amazing. Thank Such you. Such a good verse. Oh, he's amazing. He's incredible. Um, and it was it was like. It did exactly what I hoped as well. Cause I, I like felt so like stupid trying to sing on that track, which is quite a like heavy track and a heavy beat. I'm um, yeah. He just like wiped the floor, he kind of added the swagger that it needed for the track to work. Cause I just don't have that. Um, but yeah, there is another co-write on the album um, by like my favorite writer, Stara she's called. Mm-hmm. She's a, a yeah. Incredible songwriter, really, really lovely person. And we'd been writing together for a, for a bit, um, all sorts of stuff. And it came time to do this record. And I had a couple of things that I thought might be good to attempt. Can you, can you remind me which song it is that she features on? So she doesn't feature, but she kind of helped write Tangerine. Right. Yeah, yeah. On which song, sorry? Tangerine. Tangerine. Yeah, the, the second track. And did you have any other people you wanted to collaborate with or, or have feature that said no? No, those ones just, I don't think so. I'm trying to think. I don't think so. We're, do, we're, we're doing some more, we're doing a kind of, uh, you had it here, we're, we're doing like an expansion pack that will have more features on it. Oh, great. At some point, at some <laughs> point. Because this is, this is the stuff, because I, I read somewhere that there was a lot that wasn't included on this album. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, there's also, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a lot that wasn't included on this album. Some of it just didn't quite feel right, or there was like too much in one certain emotional realm. So, it, so there's not any extra songs that 
would be released as a totally new record? Maybe, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. We don't know, I can't say for sure, but okay. there's always stuff, there's always stuff floating around. But what's floating around particularly, yeah, it's, it's just good. people are very, being very collaborative at the moment. And I love that. I think everyone's kind of locked down a bit like, well, let's do something. Um, and yeah, there have been so many people getting in touch about all sorts of stuff. That's where half this crazy merch is coming from. It's like collaborative sh shoes, Pez dispensers. It's all like col collab. <laughs> um, so, but there's, yeah, so there's a lot of collaborative. Maybe, I don't know, maybe there'll be like a collaborative thing that's aside from this album but i like the idea of right now of doing like an expansion pack of collaborations with a lot of the music that's already on this record and playing with that and uh, with the merchandise which is quite 90s themed that was something i was going to ask you about is there's so many 90s early noughties pop culture references across the album because obviously that's the era that you grew up in yeah. i was wondering whether you sort of settled on this concept album of you know nostalgia childhood etc and then inserted those references at once you decided on the concept concept or whether it was the other way around that you were getting these ideas popping into your head and then you put them into songs i guess when i like it it's all about memory and i was just digging back into what i was eating watching on tv and stuff like what i was doing with my spare time everything when i was when i was reliving those memories i was thinking about the like context of those memories and those are the things that popped up so really the songs were there first and then i kind of filled them to, with these these pop culture references to give them a bit more context so there's like you can hear like karate kid dunkaroos space ghost real monsters do you remember that cartoon yeah yeah i do it's all in there it's like n64 games gta all this stuff it's yeah, like, is it goldeneye that you're referencing in uh, yeah yeah exactly that was like that was like my favorite game great right? that yeah me too Apart from, apart from Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, little shout out. Amazing, amazing video game. And I, I actually, for my birthday, Joe got me an N64 console. I wow. I had one in ages. Um, so yeah, thank you, Joe. And speaking of uh, family, there's lots of little interlude, interludes rather, on this album, which are audio recordings of your VHS. Yeah, my mum. That your mum took. Um, I was wondering how she felt when you asked i mean presumably you were like hey mum, can i feature these on the record did, uh, yeah. yeah what her reaction was to that i played the album and she fucking hated them that's <laughs> uh yeah she, <laughs> uh she said no she said absolutely not no i sound ridiculous and i said no mum, you don't sound ridiculous please please come on come on i'll make you sound really nice i put some reverb on your voice i'll like give it a nice eq and come on, please. Um, and then I think it took her a minute to like digest. And now, now she really likes the interludes. Oh, great. Great. But and why did you, why did you choose to include them in the first place? Just basically tie things together or it did tie things together. Like I, I had the kind of dream track listing done and then, uh, sometimes the two songs don't like, weave into each other like you hope so you, I, I wrote these little musical interludes that you can hear under her voice and then it still didn't feel whole so I started thinking in like a more like abstract way like what is it that like all these songs are about like the ups and downs and confusing moments in life and um trying to make sense of of things that have happened and who who's been like in the middle of all of that my entire life or what has been in the middle of all of that my entire life as my as my mum, really. So it only felt right, and it just so happened to like coincide with basically every time I go visit my mum, she gets this old like beast of a camcorder out that she filmed these videos on, and she plugs it into this old TV that she's kept like just to watch these <laughs> these videos, and um, she shows me the videos, and she laughs. It's like, look how cheeky you were, and stuff like that. Um, no, I've seen it like a million times, mum. But anyway, for Christmas, I got them all like put on CDs and USB sticks for her. And so it was just like, yoink. <laughs> like the audio. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dave from Glass Animals. Have a good day. Oh, my, it was nice to talk. Yeah. Speak uh -huh. soon again, probably. Bye-bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.